What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will draw from all these resources to give you the complete understanding of one of the most odd and interesting species in the galaxy, the Kubaz. Ending by looking at the life of the notorious spy, Garandan, and some behind the scenes facts. Their story begins at grid coordinate T9 in the Outer Rim Territories, specifically within the Slice. The Kubaki system gets its name from its single sun, and is home to presumably at least 11 planets. But the only ones we have names for are Kubaki 6, 8, and 11 and their homeworld at the 5th orbital, Kubindi. This planet would have 3 moons, a 48 hour day, and 420 days in a year, being a type 1 atmosphere breathable to most species, along with standard gravity. It was covered in dense vegetation in the forms of swamps, forests, rainforests, bogs, and rivers, and did have several large mountains, giving rise to countless life forms, including the Kubaz, but sadly they have no historical record of this time of lush growth. All of their earliest memories are after the bombardments of solar flares. Their star was a blue giant, and at some point in the distant past, began emitting powerful solar flares that reached out to this fifth orbit, and began an apocalyptic era that saw rapid shifts in the climate. Now their world was experiencing constant violent storms, mass extinctions, and the oceans themselves were beginning to evaporate away. It's unclear how long this lasted, but the solar flares burned away much of the plant and animal life, leaving a rocky and dry husk. Modern Kubindi is now deemed a dry world, meaning there are no notable bodies of water left on the surface. But of course, not all life was destroyed. The Kubaz ancestors took up refuge in the caves at the base of mountains, and explored this vast inner earth via the millions of miles of tunnels that connected much of the world. Deep underground they found springs and pools of water, and tons of different insects that would become their primary food source from then on out. Tearing through their hard exoskeletons with their two rows of teeth, found inside of this trunk that also acted as the species' highly sensitive nose. These mammalian bipeds likely used to walk on all fours, and use this prehensile snout to grab up food, and rip into hives to suck out the insects. Glands within this trunk could alert them to the most subtle of odors, likely an adaptation in response to the lack of reliance on eyesight. Deep underground, all the light had to be artificially created by them, or from the dim glow of some insects, fungi, or algae. You can't see around cave tunnel corners, so sounds and smells could give you a lot more information about the environment. And so we also see that they did not want to give away their position by making noises to communicate with each other, but developed complex forms of non-verbal communication using hand gestures and subtle vibrations of the trunk in order to create words in this sign language. They could also tell each other's emotions with the equivalent of a scowling face or smile all being told by the position of the trunk. For example, curling it up meant you were happy. Their skin was greenish black, and they had broad stubby fingers on their hands, and two large toes on each foot, with bristly bear-like hair that grew out of their pointed heads. Over the centuries, their language became more complex. Technical and philosophical ideas were all expressed via hand and nose wiggles, while back on the surface, nature was healing. The first Kubaz to emerge from the caves would likely have only heard ancient myths of living on the surface, something that must have seemed ridiculous and clearly just a story. But the world they found was incredible. The animals and vegetation that was left on the surface had undergone accelerated genetic mutation by all this exposure to the irradiating solar storms, and what stood in the dim blue light of the sun were strange, beautiful, and horrifying. Here, there were some versions of the insects they knew from deep in the caves, but in brilliant colors and as large as banthas. While the most stunning area was dubbed the Silver Forest of Dreams, this was a forest, plants, not mineral formations, but had the appearance of solid silver. These silver trees rose as high as a kilometer, and had countless 20 meter wide leaves. Because of their surface area, even though they must have been heavy, during the fall season these massive leaves would gently descend to the ground, floating on the air like an armada of shimmering ships. And traces of the water left on the surface would spread in sheets of thick fog through these woods. To make it even weirder were the silver ants, which were considered semi-sentient, somewhere between an animal and fully conscious being that were bipedal and organized into armies to wage war on anything in their path. While these were to be avoided, eventually the Kubaz living on the surface came to dominate their old stomping grounds, moving from hunting to farming and domesticating the giant insectoid beasts. And with this came the bureaucracies of advanced civilizations. They would develop designer strains of insects, and leaders to organize their people into clans, led by a queen and taking the queen's name as their clan name, with each focusing on producing specific strains of new creations. Then they got into the trade of hives, which really increased the diversity of their meals, and capitalistic markets came into play. Some of the clans proved better at the trade of designer bugs and hives, and snowballed their success into generational power, and had sprawling insect farms with millions of hives. As some of the struggling clans feared extinction, they banded together to launch the only recorded war in their history. 
The Hive Wars were an incredibly bloody civil war that, despite the losses, is not remembered for the destruction, but rather its creation of the advanced insecticulture breakthroughs that were developed from these wartime pressures. Their ability to domesticate these insects became so refined that they were considered a post-scarcity society, but still wanted to keep the competitive and private ownership aspects that promoted innovation. One feature was that each clan had color-coded patterns that were bred into their line of insects, like a medieval coat of arms in organic form. As the memory of war and starvation faded, they focused on the sciences and exploring the stars, developing starships that were capable of traveling throughout their solar system, but no hyperdrive technology. There were well-established colonies on the planets Kobaki 6, 8, and 11 by the time the Galactic Republic made first contact. By using their droids and language specialists to open up dialogue with these still non-verbal people, they noticed that for how weird these people were, they still shared some universals, like a parent's love for their children. It's said that the Kubaz loved to dote on their families. Children would be raised at home until the age of five, before sending them off to the academy. The parents would meet with the kids daily and share meals with them, and eventually the child would focus on advanced arts and sciences, and as adults, take an apprenticeship for their career. And as soon as they got better at communicating with the alien visitors, the Kubaz showed they were voracious learners, to the point that they asked so many questions that Republic officials were annoyed by the non-stop barrage. These people were so tight-knit at this point in their history that there did not seem to be any major issues with crime or warfare, but did see all of nature as something to be manipulated as they saw fit, and had no qualms killing animals or sharing people's business. Their curiosity spilled into all forms, from scientific to being what others would just call nosy, and later even espionage. But they saw this as simply collecting information to share with the community to make the lives of everyone better. There were no secrets in the clan, and all were described as being honest to a fault obsessed with being tactful and having a noble decorum. As some of them joined the Republic aliens to travel the stars, they quickly realized that they needed something to protect their eyes. Let me pause to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. BetterHelp is the world's largest therapy service and it's 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into their network of over 25,000 licensed and experienced therapists that can help you with a wide range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences when it comes to therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's through chat, text, or a video or phone call. You can message your therapist at any time and schedule therapy sessions when it's convenient for you. If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch therapists for no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you'd expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who's custom-picked for you, there's more scheduling flexibility and at a more affordable price. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash metanerds. That's betterhelp.com slash metanerds. I've also linked them down in the description. But let's get back to the video. Evolving in the dim blue sunlight, then losing some traits living underground. When they went into star systems bathed in more common red and yellow wavelengths, they had to don protective eyewear to avoid damaging their highly sensitive eyes. And despite their respect for order and truth, the one passion that could control them was their love of artwork. And there are several instances of them stealing statues and paintings and smuggling them back home to Kabindi. It wasn't long before they came into contact with neighboring systems and encountered the verpine species. Salivating at the shape and smell of these culinary delights, they captured and devoured many of them, without any acknowledgement of the fact that they were clearly a sentient, advanced people. The Verpine were some of the best designers of technology and starships, eventually forming Slain and Corporal, and they had a lot of political leverage in the Senate. Hearing that one sentient ate another was close to cannibalism in the eyes of most of the galactic community. But due to the Kubaz only recently joining this community, and that they were only exploring with the aid of Republic representatives, they weren't punished this time, but there was a warning that the full might of the military would be used to enforce the law, and the Kubaz promised to never eat their fellow sentient beings again, no matter how delicious their buggy bodies looked. Though most insectoids were skeptical, and they would forever have poor relationships with other sentient bugs like the Geonosians. The Verpine were successful in scuttling all efforts by the Kubaz to create their own hyperdrive systems, ensuring that they were tied to the Republic and its many bug engineers. Later, Jedi and Sith visitors were drawn to the Silver Forest, agreeing that this was a nexus of dark side energy. While normal folks didn't need to have a woo-woo sense to warn them, the ghost spiders were the size of a house, had meter-long claws, venom in their fangs, and spun webs that were stronger than steel. But with their new alien tech, the Kubaz were finally able to capture and raise them on their farms and herds like cattle. These ranchers had to get regular injections to develop an immunity to the spider's potent venom, and ghost spider legs became an exotic delicacy sought out by all gastronomes across the galaxy. Their entire economy had a culture evolved around the export of high-class, exotic bug cuisine. 
hosting elaborate and frequent banquets back home, and creating rare and memorable experiences for elite dinner parties in the upper levels of Coruscant. They did respect that some people were repulsed by the bugs staring up at them from the plate, but did judge them as simpletons, lacking refinement and culture. If not chefs and farmers, most Kubaz seen off-world were acting as spies or slicers. As the galaxy split under the Republic and Sith Empire, both sides tapped into this species' love of snooping, and many Kubaz were the best in the biz, a trait that got them recognition by powerful criminal organizations like the Huts. The Crime Lords could pay more credits, and headhunted top intelligence operatives to help them stay on top of the underworld. By the late Republic era, Kubindi found itself within Hut space, protecting them from the ravages of the Clone Wars, but also put them outside of Republic law, and this time saw them returning to thinking with their trunk, and reports spread of Kubaz poachers capturing exotic meals like Geonosians, Colicoids, Verpine, and even Nymoidian children, which were still in their grub form. We have to suspect that with their obsession of using selective breeding to make the tastiest bug strains, there may have been secret locations treating these people like farm animals, making tastier and tastier generations, with each generation being even more savory, sold on a bug meat black market across Kubindi. During the Imperial era, they would again try to develop their own proprietary hyperdrive tech, making it the focus of all their academies and shipwrights, but the power of Imperial credits and saboteurs kept this long-held dream from ever becoming a reality. Rebel Alliance was blamed for these attacks, and the propaganda was so effective that few Kubaz ever joined the traitors, at least for the beginning of the Imperial Era, and mostly had them acting in their historic role as spies. But there was a shift late in the Galactic Civil War era, with many Kubaz spies coming across and sharing intel of private discussions where Imperial leaders talked about them as weird creatures to be exploited for Imperial gain, wanting to take advantage of their sense of smell and expert perception of nonverbal communication to take their skills at espionage to an even greater level, but only to be tools, discarded once the rebel threat was completely neutralized. Once this was exposed, many did join the Rebels, but most acted as double agents back home and abroad, spreading everywhere from major ports to backwater cantinas, like we see with Garandan as Zavor on Tatooine. AKA Long Snoot, he was set on freeing his people from Imperial tyranny, even if that mission meant that he would have to work for them from time to time until he built up enough credits to start his resistance movement. On Kubindi, he was taken away from a rich and powerful clan, his own wife and several children who were famous senators, orators, and artists with several grandchildren thriving in both creches and academies. His personal hatred for the Empire stemmed not from those leaked documents, but his own experience with Imperial officers. One fateful day, the Empire showed up and established a sort of droid expo, with the finest new protocol droid models, packed full of information and able to translate any language you could think of. Allured by the walking, golden libraries, many clan elders followed the officers into Imperial ships and were kidnapped. Off-world, the imps pitched it like a great opportunity for riches that they could one day bring home to better their clan, but they were forced into an intense spy program that focused on pushing the limits of their excellent hearing and that snout, hoping to smell the pheromones of individuals and the scents of explosives or contraband, using them like dogs to sniff out rebels trying to blend into the crowd. They were also put in chains and forced to watch countless hours of brainwashing material to try and ensure that they never defected. But defect he would, finding an opportunity to slip away for good one day when deep undercover, using everything they taught him to create false IDs and disappear. He might have been written off as dead, but even if they wanted to hunt him, he knew that they would not admit this failure and sick the other Kubaz on him. That might just lead to more of them defecting, and any local imp he would give intel to would be focused on his local immediate issues, paying a pretty credit for Garen Dan's intel. After getting a ship, he did return home, but found Kubindi was haloed by Star Destroyers imposing a full planetary blockade. He found his way to Tatooine, and worked to create a definitive catalog of ships with a focus on their hyperdrives, in hopes of finally bringing this tech to his people. Around the same time Leia was securing the plans for the Death Star, he was paying a mysterious figure all his credits just to listen to a garbled Kubazi message. Having not heard his own language in years, he was happy to hear that it was his own family, but then was hit with the tragic news that his wife had died, and his daughter was in imminent danger. Details garbled in the transmission, but he knew he had to do anything he could to get credits as quickly as possible. He had long hated this cesspool. The smells were maddening. Too many species and chemicals, and that's just the reeking Jawas, let alone the other strange aliens. So he was eager to get off this sandball. Calling in a favor with an Imperial ally, he got the codes that he would need to get through the Kubaz blockade and got wind of a search of two droids. He sniffed out a landspeeder coming from the far-off dunes, and followed the sounds of commotion in Chalman's spaceport cantina, overhearing mysterious figures negotiating an immediate flight off-world. Waiting in between the cantina and the port, he saw the men walking with these wanted droids. 
Immediately, he contacted the nearest stormtroopers and was confident that it would soon be payday. He ordered a drink at the cantina, only to get an alert on his data pad shortly after that no credits were coming. The targets had escaped. By now, he was chatting with the Davaronian war criminal, Labria. And hoping to get him out of his despair, the devil offered him another deal. To help with an attack on a Rebel Alliance position. It is unclear what happened during this mission, or if he ever did return home. But since his people were not freed from Imperial rule until long after the Battle of Endor, when the last of the Remnant finally fled, we can be sure that he did not become the liberating hero he hoped to be. And by the time they were finally ready to have talks of joining the New Republic, the Yuuzhan Vong invaded the galaxy in 27 ABY. Jedi Knight Kip Durin and his starfighter group were able to help them evacuate en masse, with all life that stayed behind rendered extinct by Vong warships. Those left on world retreated to the ancestral hideout of the caves, but all would starve to death with the Vong form transformation. After the war was over, they would return home to work and try and restore Kabundi, but they would forever have a much lower population and diminished impact on the galaxy. So that's it for the breakdown, and as for behind the scenes facts, besides the famous spy, there were other notable individuals like Ublamun, a junker from Taurus that claimed to have discovered Vader's lost lightsaber, and Rickard Lovas, who was once a banker, but gambled it away and his debts brought him to Jakku. One participated in the Rick's Road Riots of 5 BBY on Ferrix, and another worked as a ferryman on the ice planet Pagadon, around 9 ABY. And there was even a bounty hunter who was after Grogu on Sorgon. Force sensitivity was rare among them, but there was a Sith named Glenk, and even then he still acted as a spy for a rival Sith order, and none of them ever became Jedi. The Sun Beetle was one of those bantha-sized beasts that struck fear into the ancient Kubaz, but with domestication they were able to tame it and use it as a beast of burden. And while they were eventually phased out for droids, there were pockets of off-world criminal circles that bought them up to use them in beast fights, pitting these against each other and different creatures like those seen in the Petronaki Arena, with the beetles being able to use their pincers to rip their opponent to shreds. And all this info comes from the Essential Guide to Alien Species, Alien Encounters, Ultimate Alien Anthology, Ultimate Star Wars, and the story of Garen Dan comes from a certain point of view. Thanks for watching. If you can please help me out by hitting that like button, sharing the video, or leaving a comment, it really does help with the algorithm. Subscribe if you want to see more, and if you want to see access to a lot of the older videos that I unlisted, be sure to check out the membership. But most important of all, remember, never trust a Kubaz with your ant farm or diary, and the Force will be with you. Always.